Now, in saying all this, it's pretty depressing and disgusting and hard to hear. That's the point. It's supposed to be depressing and disgusting and hard to hear. That's the truth of it. It's disgusting that 99% of Christians spin on Christ all the time. And you can't do a thing about it. There's no way to get it across to them. Now, when I say them, the point is, and this is the sadder part of it in many ways, them is me. Okay? Which is worse, to know Bible doctrine and go against it? Or never know it in the first place? That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. He wanted to make it clear that just because you know doesn't mean you're living up to it. And he's basically explaining in Romans 7 the zigzag pattern. And here he is, a guy writing scripture. That's how well he knew it. And yet he's saying, hi, I see this other law at work in my body. I know what's good and right and true. And I agree. And yet I'm coveting, which was the example he's using. So he's calling himself disgusting. And at the very end of that chapter, that's what he says. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. And then chapter 8 in Romans goes on to say, Hi, the spiritual man and the soulish man are completely different. You know, he's, he's you know, working on furthering the whole concept he started in Corinthians because Romans was written after Corinthians just after and in Luke Dateline meters dot um, PDF or HTM I showed the meters so you could tell when each of those books in the New Testament was written because they all had their datelines but the point is is that Paul is furthering the point that's what he always does in his letters he picks up the thread of his prior letter because he's writing canon he knows he's writing canon and that's what a canon writer is supposed to do is pick up the threads of prior writ and weave them into his own book so that you know the new book is canon. So when he's doing that, he's basically saying, and he starts it really within Romans, Hi, I know the rule. I know scripture. And we find out from other books that he wrote prior that he knew it better than anybody. Even when he was an unbeliever, he knew it better. He was studying at the feet of Gamaliel. Okay who was your consummate Jewish teacher in Jerusalem at the time. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, okay, which, you know, he'll later talk about in Philippians, but that was already demonstrated prior. So here he is, that well-versed, and he's saying in Romans 7 how he screws up. And then in Romans 8 he explains why. Because you got yourself with your knowledge, but your body can't obey. That's in Romans 8, verses 1 through 10. So you're scum of the earth, and so is everybody around you. And it's really important to understand how hateful and ugly and disgusting it is. It's really hard to hear. It's, expe it's especially hard to accept. And it's really important to know this is what it is because otherwise, and this is what happens to most Christians, you're going to get deflected. If you don't understand that, hey, this is the way it is and there ain't nothing that can be done about it, then you're going to get deflected like the liberals do into all of these human solutions. Like, who do we elect as president? That's not going to do any good. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't be informed, because you have to vote. That's part of your civic duty, but it doesn't really matter. It's not going to solve anything. It's tweedledee tweedledum anyhow, with any, anywhere in the world that you're voting. 
And we always say, oh, it makes so much difference that so-and-so gets elected. And so-and-so being in office is so terrible. Blah, 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 blah. Really? You know, they were talking the same way a hundred years ago. Whoever was running then, whoever was in office was deemed by some to be Satan himself. And whoever was going to, you know, be elected would be the Messiah to save the country, yeah? That was a hundred years ago. And the bad guys really didn't do that much damage in the long run. And the good guys really didn't do that much help. Now, before the Lord, you got to decide who you're going to vote for. So you do have to do your research. But on the other hand, the only one who's going to deliver you anywhere is God himself. So now what? The objective of all this, the integration of the wise, is to come to understand the integration of the wise. And how do I want to put this? Life really is bad. Life really is disgusting. Everybody really is a scumbag. Life really is cruel and useless and helpless and hopeless and disgusting. And we're all fooling ourselves that it's something better than it is. Now, for a certain amount of time, and for a lot of reasons, God allows life to look good. There's a certain proportion of your life that's going to be enjoyable. And what the human sin nature does with what's enjoyable is it extrapolates a kind of utopian idea of this life that's beyond reality. Similarly, life isn't 100% bad either, but it is bad. And we tend to play down how bad it is. Okay? We're exaggerating life one way or the other. We exaggerate it as being better than it is, or we exaggerate it as being worse than it is, or we exaggerate it just anything to deny the reality. Okay? Hobbes is a dipshit philosopher from, I forget, the Renaissance times. I'm not sure if it was Renaissance. He quipped that life is nasty, brutish, and short. The word brutish means animalistic. Okay? And when he said short, that kind of sums up the whole wit of what he said. In other words, it's nasty, and it's animalistic, so why would it matter if it's short? But by saying short at the end, what he's making clear is that we all like this life that's nasty and brutish. We don't want it to end. And of course, his whole idea was kind of screwball. Both him and Machiavelli were jerks. I absolutely hate philosophy. It's all pointless. It's all just jawing for nothing. And that's what you find out when you get to the end of your life. Is it's all been for nothing. Now the important thing to figure out though is to figure out that it's useless early. But how do you survive it? Every time, everywhere, in every life, there's some moment where you realize that this is just one great big waste of time. How do you survive that knowledge? And it's really vital because it is the truth. 
And you need Bible doctrine to get going afterwards. And you don't really come to recognize how important what God has done is until you recognize how bad life is. But how do you survive knowing it? It's really, really hard to get up in the morning once you recognize what a waste of time life is. A lot of people just kill themselves. Others, they they have to find some kind of escape. So that's why people take drugs and that's why they go to drink or they go to wine, women, and song. They're trying to forget. So really, a whole lot of us figure out early on that life is a big pain in the neck and it's worthless. And we got the wrong idea about what life is, and we certainly have the wrong idea about what God is, but one way or another, that reality breaks through. And our appreciation of it is very, very small. Okay, but the appreciation can't get bigger until... See, you know, when you're, it's like 1 plus 1 equals 2, and then you go on to your multiplication tables, and maybe after years of it, now you can do delta X and delta T, all right? Until you can go through those steps, you don't really have an appreciation of math. So the sooner that you can get past 1 plus 1 equals 2, the better. Okay, but then that means starting you earlier on the 1 plus 1 equals 2 about this life being worthless. Okay, but if you don't have enough doctrine to cope with that, then you really don't learn 1 plus 1 equals 2. So for some of us, actually for most of us, we never get that far. Okay? Okay. Pretty much anybody who's a liberal, they, they have no sense of reality whatsoever. Okay, they really don't. You just, you know, they're like, I don't know, one and a half years old. Or they're in their terrible twos. And then it's like, you can't just just walk away. They're not, they're, they're just going to stay immature and stupid their whole life. The same thing is true with most Christians. There's no point to trying to educate or awaken them to the meaninglessness of life. Because there's no there's no information in their head to cope with it. So just let them die ignorant. And then when they're dead, then you can start teaching them then. And they'll have, you know, the throughput of your little finger. And that's what it's going to stay. The poor you will have with you always. Coming to grips with that early on in this life, Christ himself had to do. Before he was 12. How do you think it was for him to realize that, hi, he's the Messiah... And there's nobody like him, so nobody's going to understand what he's talking about. And even when he's 12, his own parents don't understand. They left him behind for three days before they even knew he was missing. And he was missing because they left without him. They didn't even bother to check if he was in the caravan when they left. And then they didn't know where he'd be. And he, you know, gently says to them in a way, and the funny thing about it is that Mary's Magnificat records this moment before it even happened to her. And Luke's whole outline for the Gospel of Luke is based on benchmark events, okay? One of which is this one, when the parents leave him behind. And he says to her, when he's, you know, 12 years old, how do you not know I would be here? Now, it might be that he's in his 12th year and not yet even 12 years old. Okay? 
and because the, the the actual syllable count would lead to him being either 11 or 12 because it's in between so it could be his 12th year because in the Magnificat it's, it's borderline between the two dates the benchmarking of this and why does that matter because he had to cope with learning the hopelessness of it even in his own parents I don't know how much you remember, but there was a day when you came to realize that your parents were not perfect. When you saw that they had some severe flaws, and that was a blow. Why? Because this whole problem that about truth is that we overvalue something. And each one of us, at some point, we look at our parents or at adults and we recognize, oh, wow, they're bad. And as a child, that's threatening and upsetting. And a whole lot of children don't grow up mentally, emotionally, once they see this happen. It's a real, it's a real tough hurdle. And a whole lot of people, they, they don't get over it. They really don't. A whole lot of people just stay children their whole lives. Because of something that happened in childhood, usually related to some adult, where they were disappointed. So God's goal is to get us past that. So that we can start to appreciate what the truth really is. And then when you're growing in Christ, you, you have idealized what Christian means. You have idealized what the spiritual life means. You have idealized your teachers, your friends, the people who, you know, when you were newly believing in Christ, whoever, you know, helped you understand the gospel, oh, wow, you idealized them. And there comes a time when you have to realize that they aren't what you idealized. See, because it's supposed to be about God. Not your teacher, not the people around you, not your denomination, just Him. And part of the process of getting there is to recognize that everything around you and all the ideas you had about what the Bible meant and what Christianity was and la 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 la, that's all bupkis. And many an atheist deconversion story is about how the atheist found out it was bupkis and then he blamed God and threw out God with the bathwater of whatever falsehood that he was around. Because just like growing up, when you find out your parents aren't what you cracked them up to be, so too Christianity isn't what it's cracked up to be. 99.9% .9 of it is all falsely taught. It doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. But if you don't know what the Bible says, you don't know that's what it is. All you know is that it's a line of crap. And so you decide that God himself is crap. Because you don't have any other alternative in your head. And then you go on being childish for the rest of your life. Richard Dawkins is one of the most childish people I've ever read. His mental age and his emotional age has got to be like 12. He's impressed that he had a thousand Amazon reviews. That's in the very first paragraph of his preface of the first paperback edition, which was converted to Kindle, of the God Delusion book. I have the Kindle version. You can go read it yourself. It's got a little look inside in Amazon. My review is there also on the brain out. The guy's wacko. He must have gotten upset when he was like very young at Catholicism or whatever version of fake Christianity he was into, probably Anglican. And he never matured after that. He was really thrilled to put a verse, or not a verse, a quote, in chapter 4 of his stupid God delusion book, God is shit. That thrilled him to make that quote. How childish do you have to be? 
And I'm singling him out because that's something that you can check. But, you know, look at the Christians, how childish they are. Look at the atheists, how childish they are. Look how childish everybody is. Because we all got stuck somewhere. Christ, when he's 12, obviously at that point, had to be very much aware of the failing of his parents. How did he weather that? Well, you can see he had a great deal of maturity because he says, how do you not know that I'm supposed to be here in my father's house? That tells you two things, how he weathered it. A, he realized that he was above them. And B, he had to choose, okay, you're my parents, I obey you, but I do have a father. In other words, he didn't throw out authority. He ordered it. In other words, he hired, there's a hierarchy now. My father God, and then you're my parents because God wants it. So now he's, that keeps his faith intact. So it's okay that they're not what they, you know, what a normal child would want them to be. Getting that kind of orientation and hierarchy is what this whole spiritual life is about. I have to come to grips with knowing that life is shit in order to appreciate my relationship to God. It's a truth. Life really is shit. It is. God didn't create it that way. Isaiah, what was it? Isaiah 45, 7. I didn't create it, Tahu Wabohu. 45, 18. God didn't create it bad. So you have to say, okay, this life is bad, but I get you. You're God, and you got another use for it. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. Yes, it's crap, my body of death. But on the other hand, men die. I got Christ. Classical Greek men on the one hand, duh on the other hand. And that's what Paul's basically doing. He's exercising that form of Greek debate technique on the one hand, on the other hand. So on the other hand, Romans 8, yeah, you come into this life and you're living this life and it's all garbage and this, the, the body can never be spiritual. On the other hand, I can just use one John one nine and be spiritual. Paul didn't call it one John one nine because the book hadn't been written yet. But the Old Testament—that's what you did. You brought the animal to the priest. You named your sin to God. You put your hand on the animal. The priest simultaneously or nearly at the same time slit the throat of the animal. That depicted Christ dying in the future for your sins, and then you got to eat some of it, and the priest got the rest. And some of it got burned on the altar. Communion with God due to sinning. Because the sin went into the animal. You sin, you get dinner. The whole Mosaic Law is a parody of pagan ritual. And that's the way you need to start to think about it once you're in this body and you realize how bad life is. Okay, one of the greatest things that you can come to in this life is to recognize that all your yesterdays don't mean a thing. That's a happy conclusion once you realize that life is shit. For most of the human race, that is not a happy conclusion. Everybody in the human race is going to reach a point when they realize that all of their past good or bad, nice or not nice, is pointless. And that's a moment of extreme upset for them. For most people, it comes at the moment that they're dying. Okay? For a lot of people, it arrives sooner. And then they want to kill themselves. 
Because it's like, what's the point of living? It's really hard to survive that moment once you realize that your life doesn't mean anything. All your yesterdays, all your past glories, so what? The conqueror worm beats you. Yesterday, you were the toast of the town. Yesterday, everybody wanted your autograph. And today, they don't, they don't even know who you are. That's a really hard come down. Here you were, this famous politician, or this famous movie star, or this famous director, and now it's 20 years later and nobody cares or knows who you are, and when you try to tell them who you are, so what? That's very offensive. That's very upsetting. Your whole life was for nothing. Okay, but I can sit here... And I look back on my life, the high moments and the low moments, they're all dead. They're all gone. Most everybody I know by now is also dead. So, I too, for I don't know how long now, will soon be dead. So, I know him. So I really don't give a flip. I got to spend my time learning Bible while I was here. So I really don't give a flip. He kills me tomorrow. He takes me out long and slow. I get cancer. I don't know. And I don't care. And I don't really care if anybody remembers me either. If somebody says, well, brain out's wonderful. So if somebody says, oh, brain out, you're a piece of dog doo doo. So no offense. But all my yesterdays, if I don't have Bible doctrine as a result of it inside my head that I can live on right now, then I honestly don't care about yesterday. And I don't care if you like me or you don't like me. And you shouldn't care if I like you or I don't like you. Does it matter if you and I agree with each other? If we do, well, yeah, okay, fine, that's a pleasure for... What, five minutes, five years, five seconds? That's like eating food. You eat it, you like it while you're eating it, and you forget it. Why should it life be something else? See the point of this? If life is shit, then anything nice about it, well, that's extra. Meanwhile, that's the fact of it that life is shit. So you're glad to be rid of it. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7 and 8. Now he actually uses the word shit in Philippians 3, 8. That's the actual word for it. The actual word, yeah, it's literally plural, turds. That's what he co considers his whole life. Everything I worked for, everything I earned, everything I did is shit. Literally what he says in Philippians 3.8. Greek word is skubala. Modern Greek word for it is scat. And that's what it means, is shit, merd, in French. Badly pronounced French. It's a swear word. It's meant as a swear word. Paul uses words like that. So there you go. You can use the word shit and know it's a Bible word. Philippians 3.8. Life is shit. All of his accomplishments, all of his good deeds are shit. Isaiah 64, 6 calls them menstrual rags. Yes, you could call that worse than shit. Once you can come to grips with that, then anything nice that happens to you, well, okay. But you don't, you don't any longer need it. It takes a long time to get used to that. It's really hard to let go of the childish notion, of, you know, the Wizard of Oz. And, you know, the avocado kitchen and the magical carpet and a windows that actually works. It's really hard to let go of that stuff. It's really hard to wake up every day and know that life is shut. 
and to actually adjust to that. But really, sooner or later, we all have to. And how well we weather that recognition kind of determines the rest of our life. But once you can get past it with Bible doctrine, then you end your life with you know, no regrets. And any moments of happiness you have, well, okay. Any moments of suffering that you had, well, okay. Because then you see it God's way. You're looking at it with God's eyes. Life really is shit. It's doing him no good. And then you start to appreciate the beauty of being able to take dog doo-doo and turn it into diamonds. All this doo-doo is getting turned into diamonds of his thinking in your head. And your whole life is just fertilizer. And so is everybody else's. And he's turning the fertilizer into something beautiful in your head that's going to go with you into heaven when you leave this shit body behind. That's when you really start to orient to the truth. And I'm only just getting there now. Because I was just as stupid as everybody else. I idealized this life and I had no excuse. I had life bad early. To, you know, kind of like inoculate me early. But I wanted to hold on to the dream. I mean, I was tortured by the time I was 12. And I needed to be. Because I had the, you know, the wrong idea about life. Oh, it's supposed to be nice and wonderful and just like the fairy tales. No. So I needed to have it literally carved into my skin. Now, some of us aren't so stupid and aren't so stubborn. So you get a couple of hard knocks and you start to really question life. Sooner or later it has to happen or we can't orient to the truth for what it is. And even then, there's always this, you know, cloud of idealism. Because we watch the movies and, oh, they lived happily ever after and all these other things. And nobody likes something that's too depressing. But until you can weather it, you can't appreciate what God has done. Think about it.